Uh, I'm Colin Paul, the Social Science Co-Director here at CSAC, and we are thrilled uh, today to welcome uh, Salman Khan from uh, the Fletcher School at uh, Tufts University. Uh, Professor Khan teaches international history and Chinese foreign relations at the Fletcher School at Tufts, where he also directs the Water and Oceans Program at the Center for International, international Environment and Resource Policy. He's the author of Haunted, uh, Haunted by Chaos, China's Grand Strategy from Mao Zedong to Xi Jinping, uh, which is the topic of the conversation today, uh, which was named a top book of 2018 by the American Interest. Uh, he's also the author of Muslim Trader, Nomad Spy, China's Cold War and the People of the Tibetan Borderlands, uh, which came out in 2015. Uh, he's a bunch of other publications. Uh, his new project is on, uh, on the Indo-Pacific as a body of water itself. Um, uh, he's a fascinating guy, and we're really looking forward to his uh, talk today on uh, China's grand strategy uh, and historical perspective. So welcome to CSAC. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for braving what is as unpleasant as weather apparently gets in Palo Alto. <laughs> this has happened the last two times I've come here. It's been rain, um, so I'm sorry if I have something to do with that. I guess it did. Um, Sure, I can stand up so that the rest of you can see me, especially since you're backbenching there. Um, Colin asked me how much time, if I'd spent time here before. Um, the answer was yes, partly because the Hoover Archives, which Lin Xiaoping, who's sitting somewhere in the back there, curates so wonderfully well, um, are a dream for anybody working on East Asia. Um, you know, if you die and go to heaven as someone studying East Asia, you'll probably wind up in the Hoover Archives, um, one way or another. But it's a particular pleasure to be at CSAC because as I was walking around the building, I realized how much research on China and the Cold War that has shaped me and shaped the way I look at this has come out of here. You only have to look at the posters of John Lewis and Shirley Thai's books over here to get a sense of what's possible. So it's a real pleasure to be here and to share what I have to say. Usually when I start this book talk, I begin by describing how it began in a moment of frustration with people not understanding how China thought about North Korea um, way back when. Um, I think it's fair to say that in the time the book has been out, that sense of frustration has deepened, um, and not just about North Korea, but about the way we think about China and talk about China in general. There are people who will tell you with complete confidence that China has finally dropped the act and is showing its true colors. And this is what we have all been fearing all along. And those peaceniks in Washington got it wrong. That's not true. Uh, there are people who will tell you that Xi Jinping has changed everything about China, um, which is slightly truer, but also very misleading. Because while quite a bit has changed, um, it's also important to bear in mind what has not. Um, there are certain continuities in what she is doing, to my mind, that resonate with the era we're going to talk about. Um, there's indeed certain continuities in grand strategy, um, stretching from Mao Zedong through Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and into the Xi era. And that's what I want to talk about today, perhaps provide a historical baseline and see if that helps us understand China and what it wants a bit better than we otherwise might. What do I mean by grand strategy? Um, I mean quite simply the marshalling of different categories of power, so diplomatic, military, economic, to achieve an overarching objective. Um, that sounds kind of simple, but it's not the way pundits, at least, typically think about policy over here. So grand strategy is not um, the Russians did X in Ukraine. What do we do now? Or the Chinese did Y in the South China Sea or in Hong Kong, and what do we do now? It's a more overarching sense of what is it we want in the world? Um, how is the world going to make that difficult or easy to attain? And how then do we weld the different tools at our disposal to get there? It's a more overarching way of thinking. And the curious thing about delving through Chinese archival sources and other records over the time was to say, you know, there actually was a consistent grand strategy. I'm not saying that everything fit in it. Like every other person, um, Chinese grand strategists were capable of inconsistency, capable of lapsing from what they had laid out. But by and large, enough fit to my mind to be worth talking about. Um, there were consistencies and differences in the grand strategies pursued by the leaders we'll talk about today. And the consistency to my mind stemmed from two things. First, there were memories of being broken and being broken in very specific ways. 
all the people we'll talk about today have a memory or the ghost of a memory of the warlord era, a memory or the ghost of a memory of the Cultural Revolution, and in some cases, a memory of certain other things that we'll talk about, and those shaped the way they saw the world. The second was geography. Um, all these people, whether they liked it or not, were dealing with a country that was stuck with a lot of neighbors on large porous land frontiers and had a long vulnerable coastline. By definition, this sounds kind of fundamental, but it's going to give you a different view of the world from a country that has, say, Canada, Mexico, and three oceans for neighbors. Just your sense of what's possible and what your place in the world is, is going to be very different based on those things. <laughs> The differences came in because circumstance mattered. 1949 is different from 1969, different from 1979, different from 2019. And that means different grand strategies are going to come into play. Personality mattered. Um, curiously enough to my mind, and we can talk about this during Q&A, it mattered most perhaps in Deng Xiaoping's case, and I'm happy to go on about that for as long as you want. But for all those differences, all the people we're going to talk about today saw China as a brittle entity in a hostile world, and their job was quite simply to protect it. That's the grand strategy. That's the overarching objective. Now, that sounds kind of basic. Basic security sounds like something any state would aim for. But it's not that basic. First of all, remember what I just said about being broken. Um, these are people who all woke up every day thinking China could fall apart and in Xi Jinping's case, still do. Till fairly recently in the United States, that's not a problem our grand strategists have had to grapple with. Um, it's just a very different set of objectives over there. The other reason it's not that basic is if you think about the various objectives that have been attributed to China over the years. Um, China is out to overtake the world. China is out to overtake the United States. China <laughs> is out to make a world safe for authoritarianism, whatever that last bit means. The world hegemony bit or overtaking the United States may or may not happen, but if they do happen, it will be in quest of that larger goal, not as an intrinsic goal in and of itself. So how do you do this? Um, you have to maintain a balance of power. That means being closer to all the great powers than they are to one another. You have to modernize your military, and you have to deal with it while keeping your political economy in sync. And all the Chinese leaders will talk about had a sense of how to bring those things together that sometimes led them massively awry, as we'll talk about. I think I want to talk very quickly before we go there of how the state comes into existence. Because in 1920, there's a young man named Mao Zedong. He's not quite young, but he thinks he is at that point, um, saying, you know what? Um, great China, the China that we more or less take for granted today, doesn't exist. It's a myth. What you have today is lots of little Chinas. And to get to great China, um, you have to cobble those little Chinas together. This is quite a vision to have in 1920, because he's absolutely right. There are six or seven different people whom you might legitimately or illegitimately call the government of China, warlord governments that can conduct trade deals, sign diplomatic agreements, and so on and so forth. And to actually have this glimpse of this larger whole is quite something. Um, simply insisting that the little patch of land, the Jiangxi Soviet that Mao controls as a state, is quite revolutionary in and of itself. Um, but it is a state to his mind, even if he has to take it on the run after having a tussle with the nationalists in the form of Chiang Kai-shek, who we'll come to later. Um, we know a, a lot about Mao's ideas of nimble warfare. When the enemy advances, we retreat. When the enemy retreats, we advance. Of mobilizing the peasants so that you have the people on your side. Less appreciated is Mao Zedong's sense of diplomacy um, during this time. There is the idea in his China, at least, that you can work with everyone around you as long as it helps your little batch of China. So there will be outreach to the Tibetans. There will be outreach to the Muslims. There will be outreach to the Soviets. There will be outreach to the Americans. As late as 1941, when supposedly he and his great rival Chiang Kai-shek have come together in a united front against the Japanese, there are talks of reaching out to the Japanese. Maybe the Japanese can help us secure our little bit of China. And there is always the belief that the Americans will be sensible and people who can be reasoned with down the line. And we can talk about that more during Q&A. Um, after World War II ends, it's an interesting question. Could the Chinese Civil War have been averted? Mao actually seems to think it could have, but that's a separate question. What does happen, of course, is that the Civil War is renewed and Mao eventually prevails. And he prevails using a similar grand strategy to the one he used before, 45. Um, diplomacy, he's very good at peeling away Jiang's allies. 
um, including within China, and managing the political economy just a little bit letter, better than Chiang Kai-shek does. The other thing that's worth bearing in mind about the Chinese Civil War is some of the, the mo that some of the most formative engagements come after October 1st, when the PRC is formally proclaimed. Um, if you think about the conquest of Xinjiang, where air power proves crucial, or if you think of the conquest of Hainan Island, which comes after a check in Guningto, which is why the ROC is where it is today, um, you're beginning to see the Chinese leadership get a sense of we need naval power and air power. Um, and getting that integrated into their armed forces. The transformation of what was once a ragtag bunch of guerrillas into a modern fighting force. The other thing that's worth talking about briefly over here are the way talks with Joseph Stalin unfold, because perhaps the most interesting point over here is the harping on the preservation of peace. Um, we don't think of either Stalin or Mao as peace-loving people over here, typically, unless you've dealt into this period. But at the time, they're saying, you know, we could get five years, 10 years, perhaps even 20 years of peace, um, get some breathing time. And the interesting thing from the Chinese side is that even while he's in Moscow, Mao is cabling his subordinates in China, saying, reach out to the British, reach out to the Japanese, reach out to the Americans, see if there are trade deals possible there. You might be leaning to one side, to use the phrase that's become a very common description of Mao's parlance at that time, but leaning to one side doesn't mean falling over. You have to have room to breathe. Okay. Now, it's interesting to speculate on just what might have happened if that peace had prevailed and if Mao had been given that room to breathe. But that room, of course, is eliminated by Korea. Um, two things are worth saying about the Korean War from the Chinese side. One is that the decision making is not a given, um, which is one of the things I changed my mind about as I delved deeper into this. There's actually a raging debate within Beijing about whether or not to do this. Um, Mao wants to do it for romantic reasons, not grand strategic ones. The Koreans are our brothers. We suffered with them. It goes hard on the heart to let them suffer. And that's actually not enough to carry the day with his colleagues. Um, it takes Peng Dehuai being summoned in to give the geostrategic rationale for it. And Peng says, look, you can't leave a hostile force, that's the Americans, in charge of the Taiwan Strait, which has been neutralized, and on your northeastern frontier, and expect to secure this country that you have worked so hard to secure. It's simply not doable. And that's the bit that causes the PRC to go to war. The other thing that's worth remembering is that this isn't a war that's occurring in isolation. You still have Guomindang remnants ravaging the Chinese coast. You still have American forces parachuting in along all those forest land frontiers. And you still have forces down south to deal with. So there's a lot going on here. And even with the armistice in the Korean War, those problems aren't going away. This country the communists have secured is still deeply <clears throat> insecure. Dealing with this requires paying attention to the balance of power. Um, so we're going to lean to one side with the Soviet Union. The Soviets give us money. They give us weaponry. It's ideologically appropriate. That's great. That doesn't mean not reaching out to other people. Um, interestingly enough, in the Chinese conception of the balance of power, smaller batter, powers matter too. So we're going to reach out to Poland. We're going to reach out to India. We're going to reach out to Pakistan. The Americans have allies in the region, alliances directed against us. We can reason with those allies, with Thailand, with Pakistan, and maybe use those allies to try to influence the Americans, even the Japanese. Um, we can even reach out to the Americans. There are actually extensive talks between China and America this, at this time that founder over the question of Taiwan. The attempt, and we can debate how successful it was, seems to have been to remain closer to all the powers than they were to one another. And it's an attempt marked by a belief that just keeping on talking is a sufficient success. So we, think it, we tend to think of diplomacy as, is it meaningful? Did it achieve an outcome? For the Chinese at this point, it just seems keeping on talking, even if you don't reach an agreement, is good enough. Because if you keep on talking, you're not dead. And you might conceivably have a chance to reach agreement tomorrow. Not that they won't use force. Um, there's this very dangerous idea in the Taiwan Straits that you can dial force up and down to signal political intentions. Um, they do decide to build a bomb. But it's force in the backing of diplomacy, as it were. Okay. This is going to stay through, by the way, through the late 50s and early 60s when there's a shift in the nature of power and the falling out with the Soviets and the falling out with India happens. Doesn't mean abandoning a quest for the balance of power. It just means reorienting it. So if you fall out with the Indians, you strengthen your relationships with Nepal, 
with Burma, with Pakistan, still trying to preserve a way of opening there, much as you do with the Soviet Union. Even after all the spats, there's extensive attempts to talk Khrushchev back from what is seen as the imperialist camp. So that's the balance of power aspect of it. I want to touch one other aspect of grand strategy, which is political economy. And here, of course, the discussion tends to focus on the Great Leap Forward, that insane plan to overtake the United States and Britain, which leads to massive communes, massive dams, and death at a truly massive and wasteful scale. The point that gets missed in most discussions of the Great Leap Forward is that it's actually a national security plan. Um, when Mao is saying, I want to overtake the United States. He's not doing it because he just wants to overtake the United States, although that's all well and good. He points out that you cannot have a modern military and modern defense without a modern economy. That's more or less the same insight Deng Xiaoping is later going to have and take credit for in the form of opening and reform. It's just that having had this insight, Mao's ideas of how to pursue it are completely ridiculous, proof positive that even if you have a grand strategy, it might not be a very good one. Um, and he's actually going to have doubts about this fairly early on, and they are doubts that are going to be talked away by people who don't want to report bad news to the chairman. Zhao Ziyang, the great, the sainted Zhao Ziyang, is the person who will tell Mao Zedong, it's not the plan that's at fault, it's the cadres implementing it. If we had decent people carrying out your plans, Chairman Mao, we would be able to achieve the goals you have set within a month, max. So people are allowed to persist with the Great Leap Forward. And you can see here the seeds of something like the Cultural Revolution. It's not the plan that's at fault, it's the people. If you were only to remake the people, rewire their minds somehow, everything would be okay. And that gets us to the Cultural Revolution. So the Cultural Revolution is a phrase that obscures just how many different things are actually happening in China between 1966 and 1976. One of the best books on this, by the way, was done by Andrew Walder recently. It just came out with Harvard University Press and it's worth a read. But the first phase is the attack on embassies, the craziness abroad. And that's a dramatic departure from everything we've talked about in China to this point. The fact that China would jeopardize its foreign relations in this way is really uncharacteristic if you're setting it against the pattern of diplomacy thus far. The second phase is marked by a return to strategic prudence. And it seems to have been triggered by the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. And that's where Mao suddenly wakes up and thinks, you know, life could be problematic for me too. It turns out he's still capable of thinking in terms of balance of power politics. He still remarkably has a military that can function and achieves the Sino-American rapprochement. Uh, the way we conventionally tell the story of the Sino-American rapprochement is the <coughs> Chinese and the Soviets fell out, um, poor benighted Chinese thinking they could trust the Soviets. Henry Kissinger came swooping in, rescued the Chinese from the Soviets. The Chinese were on our side. We stuck it to the Soviets. Hey, presto, great victory in the Cold War. Um, that telling of the story obscures a lot that's worth commenting on over here. Um, first of all, in Kissinger's thinking, the plan was never to quote unquote, stick it to the Soviets. The idea was to achieve a balance of power and be closer to the Soviets and the Chinese than they were to one another. In other words, the idea wasn't to shut the Soviets out and show them who was boss. It was to give us slightly more leverage in our dealings with them. The China bit that gets shut out over here is that the Chinese, whatever their various faults, were not stupid. Um, there's actually a huge gap in 1969 when they're at war with the Soviets and Kissinger's visit to China. And during that gap, you cannot, if you're a responsible leader sitting in Beijing, count on American goodwill. That means you will have to find a modus vivendi with the Soviets. And despite the border clashes, there are significant attempts to talk to one another that keep going all the way through the Sino-American rapprochement and later. One of the fears that comes up in China later indeed is that the United States might drag, try to drag China into a war with the Soviets, which we want no part of. So that's one part of what's happening over here. The other thing that comes with the Sino-American rapprochement, incidentally, is the beginning of opening and reform. One indicator of this being that Deng Xiaoping is rehabilitated. And Deng tells Mao, you know, you've got to put this country to work. It's a massive country booming with entrepreneurial energy at the edges. We've got people waiting to make China great do something about this. No country in the world, not even the United States, Deng says, can go it alone in this modern world. You got to be part of it. 
And Mao says, hop to it. Um, one indicator of this is that trade with America burgeons, as does that with Japan. Exports to the United States go from zero to about $156 million worth between 1971 and 76. Imports go from nothing to over $160 million worth in the same time. China's open for business. This is the opening part of opening and reform, and it's happening in the dying years of Chairman Mao. But the dark forces of the Cultural Revolution never went away. Um, it's one thing to start a cultural revolution. It's a very different thing to try to stop it. And this is where the third phase comes in. Um, you had revolutionaries, ideologues, ranged on one side in the form of the Gang of Four, Jiang Qing, Wang Hongwen, Jiang Qingxiao, and Yao Wenyuan. And they go after Deng Xiaoping, um, saying, you know, this whole notion of production, not revolution, is counter-revolutionary. Mao, for reasons we can talk about, sort of fluts us in the middle till Deng makes a mistake and seems to get too big for his britches. On July 4th, 1976, Deng is stripped of his post and sent away to a quote-unquote safe place. Hua Guofeng is named Mao's successor, and Mao himself dies in September 76. He has unified China against tremendous odds. He has kept it safe against the United States, against the Soviet Union, um, and he's kept a balance of power. Um, he has also killed millions of his own people. Make of him as a grand strategist what you will. Okay. Now, you can see various different paths open to China at this point, and the fact that it chose the path it uh, did is down, I think, largely to Deng Xiaoping. The key thing to understand about Deng Xiaoping, to my mind, um, and I might be wrong about this for various reasons, is that Deng traveled by boat. Um, as a young man, he has to take a ship to get to Paris. There is nothing, my friend, absolutely nothing, as water rat says to Mole. Half so much worth doing is simply messing about in boats. If you simply mess about in boats the way Deng Xiaoping did, think of what you'll see that a Mao Zedong, who's also well-traveled, but only well-traveled by land, won't have seen. You'll have seen ports where riches come in from the ocean on ships. You'll see trade at the edges, people bartering in several different languages and growing rich on the proceeds, including overseas Chinese, by the way. All of this is going to stay with Deng and inform his vision for where China should be going. Um, he is a spy. Um, he's run missions behind enemy lines, so he knows how to keep his own counsel. <coughs> he believes in the party. You need a strong party to quash warlordism and liberalism. And he has a certain practical bent. Whatever works, works. Um, one country, two systems, which comes up for Hong Kong, is actually a product of his encounters with Tibet back in 1951, where he says, you know, if this thing works with some measure of autonomy, why not let it work? Um, he's an impatient, caustic character. He's capable, though, of suppressing some of that impatience when he's coming back into the party. He comes back when Hua has taken on and successfully defeated the Gang of Four, and his political savviness is very much on display here. Um, I'm not going to take credit for this. I'm not going to be trouble. You, Chairman Hua, have won a great victory. He's really good at this. Remember, he survived the Mao Zedong era. And he is hell-bent on refusing the top job of chairman. Um, Chairmanships are for other people, great leaders. The Deng Xiaoping style of leader just doesn't believe in taking credit. It's much easier to have other people on the front taking both the credit and the blame for your schemes. And say, so, you know what, I, I wasn't in charge. Um, we tend to take opening and reform for granted. There's a school of thought that says after the Cultural Revolution, this was the only path China could go. And that's not true. Um, you can see several different ways in which China could have gone dramatically wrong during these years. There's a dazzling act of intellectual warfare that Deng launches in order to get opening and reform through the party. And the way he does this is very interesting. Um, it's almost a Talmudic debate. He says, you can't interpret Mao Zedong thought literally without doing damage to it. To truly get Mao Zedong thought, to understand what the chairman really wanted us to do, what you have to do is to grasp that its central precept is to seek truth from facts. Seek truth from facts, Chairman Mao said. And seeking truth from facts, what do we see? We see that places like Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, they're racing ahead economically. We're nowhere. We're still up busy arguing about whether raising three ducks is socialism, but when you get to five, it's capitalism. That's a ridiculous thing to be doing. Um, getting rich is not anti-Mao. It's to not get rich that's anti-Mao. And the people who don't want you, who don't want you to get rich, are the gang of four. Remember those cultural revolutionaries who criticized your family's unleashed chaos on this country? They're the people 
who don't want you to get rich. They're the people who are anti-production. Dazzling act of politics here. There's no sincerity here, by the way. He tells Bush Sr. at one point, yeah, I'd criticize Mao, but to criticize Mao too openly would be to create chaos in this country. And that's one thing I don't want to do. The whole point is to avoid chaos and focus on getting rich. So agrarianism, agrarian reform is encouraged. If it works, let it work. So industry is modernized. Not afraid of seeking advice from anybody and everybody here. The Japanese, the Americans, overseas Chinese abroad. There's been a healthy smuggling relationship with Taiwan. Bring it out into the open. Let's all get rich together. Um, that's Deng Xiaoping for you. The other side to getting the economy in order is cuts, incidentally. Um, aid to third world countries is no longer going to be doled out the way it once was in Mao's years. Um, this is going to be a time of China first. The one-child policy, which is completely brutal and is going to backfire dramatically later on, is part of these cuts. And finally, there are cuts to the military. Um, part of this is simply forcing aged heroes to retire. He's very impatient with the fact that some of them are 64 or 65, and they're still collecting perks and salaries. It's no way to run a country. It's not that he's a pacifist. Um, it's not that Deng said, let's focus on economic growth and let warfare take care of itself, because that's not for us. It's just that he thinks an, uh, a military is supposed to serve a purpose. A military is supposed to keep your country safe. If your military bankrupts your economy, you're not going to be able to do that. <laughs> um, a military, therefore, is something that should be focused. Retire these cadres, get proper equipment, get a navy. Not a blue water navy, says Dung. We just need one that can protect our shores. And we need an air force. And this is where the bulk of our investment is going to go. That's the economic component of Dung's strategy. Diplomatically, similar approach to the balance of power and similar idea of, you know what, we can let specific differences, even if they're quite extreme, slide as long as we keep channels of communication open, given there are larger stakes. So there is a larger stake in the relationship with America, which means we're going to keep talking to them despite despising the Taiwan Relations Act. There is a larger stake in the relationship with Japan, which means that arguing about these pesky islands, the Senkaku slash values slash whatever you want to call them, and arguing about textbooks can't get in the way of letting the Japanese help us get rich. Um, the Soviets are a pain in the neck, but we can't stop talking to them. We have to keep talking to them, and we're not going to sever trade with them, come what may. Idea of one country, two systems is also floated at this time. Um, he's very proud of one country, two systems, and joint development. These, he points out, are things China came up with in its encounters with reality. It's going to take back Hong Kong. But interestingly enough, he says this to the British he doesn't want to mess with Hong Kong. Hong Kong works. Why would I mess with something that works? We in China have grown rich of Hong Kong system. This country is big enough to contain two systems. And I think he's quite sincere about his assurances with that. And of course, one country, two systems is also touted as a potential model for Taiwan. It doesn't work with Taiwan, but it does start a raging debate there um, where people say, you know, maybe this is the way to go and other people suspect it's just a communist ploy. There's one big exception to all this, and that's the war with Vietnam, um, where Dung departs from just about everything we've talked about, starts a completely unnecessary and counterproductive war, loses, and then refuses to talk to the Vietnamese for all time to come. Um, there's lots of possible explanations floating around for this, including how intelligent Dung was, some of these perpetuated, of course, by Dung himself. To my mind, and we can talk about this later if you want to, the simplest one is the best, which is that Dung like anybody else, was capable of mistakes. I want to very quickly touch on the Tiananmen Square massacre because this gets misunderstood. It is completely part and parcel of this grand strategy. Um, he's been very clear that what has allowed China to thrive thus far in 1989 is the stability guaranteed by the party. And whereas the conversation here tended to be, and still tends to be, well, once you liberalize economically, a political liberalization is also natural. Deng, I think, if pushed to it, would have said, of course, you don't get it. The only way I was able to push the economic liberalization I was was by knocking heads together in the party and imposing some measure of political strongman leadership on this place. That's what it took to get this going. Um, and when protests break out in 1986 first, they have to be stopped. The problem, as he sees it, is that the party is not asserting its authority. This could take us back to the Cultural Revolution. Young people don't get it, is a line he seems to be coming back to over and over again. Deng didn't like young people. They hadn't been through what he had been through. They had no idea of what China was like. All they wanted was chaos. Um, and they just don't understand that you need a strong central party to keep China going. So the interesting thing to my mind with Tiananmen is not 
why did he bring out the troops? It's what on earth took them so long? That, to my mind, is the great unsolved mystery of the Tiananmen Square massacre. It's also worth remembering that he has this idea that Tiananmen is for a purpose, to allow for the continuation of opening and reform. And when people within the party try to cite what happened over there as a reason to dial back on it, um, Deng Xiaoping, who was feted when Xi Jinping undid the retirement system for imposing a responsible retirement system in Chinese leadership, uh, Deng Xiaoping, who doesn't hold a formal post, comes marching out of his retirement and goes stumping down south in one of the finest populist campaigns imaginable to make sure that reform and openings stay the course. Um, retirements for other people, the Deng Xiaopings of the world, don't do it. But even Deng has to die at some time. Right? And this is where the Jiang Zemin Hu Jintao era comes in. The rap against Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao is that they're dull. Um, when I was looking at them a while back, like more or less a decade now, um, this was much of the literature. They're dull. They're not the men Mao was. They're not the men Deng Xiaoping was. What have they ever done? Um, I used to think American politics were dull too, and I kind of wish they were again. And that's part of what's made me think that maybe having a dull leadership is not the worst thing in the world. Uh, the other thing that's unfair about calling them dull is it's surprising how much takes place during their tenure and how much they see China through. Whether you're thinking of the Taiwan Straits crisis, whether you're thinking of the accidental on purpose bombing of the Yugoslavian embassy, of the Chinese embassy in Yugoslavia, whether you're thinking of two financial crises, there's a lot they see China through and they do it quite well. The first call that Zhang makes, and this is an interesting one, is we're going to stick with opening and reform. Um, there's a lot of debate in the air, especially post 89. Do we want to democratize? Is one option on the table. Do we want to go back to the days of Mao Zedong? Is another. Or do we want to just stick the course? And Jiang says we're going to stick the course, but for the difference, we're going to bring ideology back into the picture by educating people in it, by telling them that there is this common glue of beliefs within the party that's meant to hold us together. And he starts constructing an ideological canon. Mao is part of it, of course, but so is opening and reform. And the great virtue of invoking Deng as part of this ideology is you can stick with growing rich, not just in China's booming East Coast, but out in the far west, places like Xinjiang and Tibet. Um, there's violence in Xinjiang later on, incidentally, that is going to cause Hu to focus on economics, bring GDP per capita up to the level of the rest of the country by 2015, he says. It's not that we're not going to have a police we're not going to have a policing system there where we can round up people and so forth. It's just that you have to get them rich too. Now, there's challenges to doing this. Part of it's corruption, of course. If you have one party that is cop, judge, and enforcer at the same time, and there's a lot of money floating around, you can imagine the problems that are going to come up. Part of it is a vulnerability to global shocks, which means global responsibilities. So when the Southeast Asian financial crisis comes around, the Chinese leadership is going to make sure that there's money available for financial and investment banks. They're going to keep their MMB stable, and they're going to boost internal demand. It's a run up to the 2007 8 financial crisis when you see the stimulus, and you see also a turn to the BRICS, you see a turn to emerging markets, that notion of smaller players mattering. And finally, of course, there's hectoring Americans on their responsibility, saying, keep up aid to low-income countries. Keep up with trade and financial liberalization. We all have a stake in this. And you Americans cannot step back from this order, the gospel of which you preach. Okay? That is a crucial part of it. Where the West, or where at least in the United States, there was this idea that the end of the Cold War brought a unipolar moment. Chiang Zemin sees a multipolar world. Um, the Americans matter, but so do the Russians, so do the Japanese, so do the Europeans. And the matrix of relationships reflects that notion of the balance of power we've talked about. With the Americans especially, there's this idea that we can keep on talking through our differences. And that actually enables both sides to come out alive of three crises that should never have been able to happen in the first place. The Taiwan Straits crisis, the bombing of the Chinese embassy in Yugoslavia, and the Hainan spy plane incident. In each of those cases, you can see how a misstep on either side could have led to drastic situations that were war. In each case, however, better counsels prevailed after initial outbursts of anger, and people were able to talk themselves down from the cliff. 
America is just one piece on the board. There are stronger relations with Russia and Central Asia, which post 9-11 seems kind of farsighted if you're in Beijing. Can't have the Americans running about unchecked on China's western frontier. Trade and exchange with Moscow burgeons. There are proclamations of friendship that people forgot, as we talked about the burgeoning Sino-Russian friendship now. And there is a promotion of multipolarization, which means containing the Americans. Um, who is going to call Central Asia the old Silk Road? This is the progenitor to the new Silk Road, because anything who could do, she could do better. And they're going to seek better diplomatic ties everywhere. Not that they're neglecting force. Um, the Gulf War is a big wake-up call. But the idea here is that you have to modernize force, right? Um, for your forces to work, they have to be more modern. That means cuts to your military, investing in technology that works. Um, one other thing that's worth flagging here while we talk about the Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao era, is civil military relations. One of the truly interesting developments that came from the Third Taiwan <coughs> Straits crisis was that leadership in both Chinese and American military said, we have a vested interest in talking to one another. And Joseph Preer, who was in charge of PACOM and later ambassador to China, said, you know, I want to talk to my counterpart. And he starts doing what good American military people do and starts talking to his counterparts. And Jiang, as Preer described it to me, came, poked him in the chest, but in a nice way, and said, Admiral, what are you doing with my Navy? And Preer said, well, I'm trying to build trust. And Jiang says, but for there to be trust, there must first be understanding. And for there to be understanding, there must first be communication. Um, you can see why Jiang has a reputation for being dull. I've read that several times, and I'm still not quite sure what he was trying to get across. But the gist of it is a concern about the possible independence of the military. The military should serve the party, not the country, if stability is to be guaranteed. Active defense is the main line in China's military precepts at this point. But you have to ask yourself, especially as you see a country coming to this size, where is the line between active defense and outright hostility? Um, when you're that size, when you're that powerful, it becomes a difficult tightrope to walk. Which brings us, of course, to Xi Jinping. I think with Xi, it's important to understand what has changed and what has not. And hopefully, this historical review has helped us. You know, some things might have stayed the same. The key thing, to my mind, with Xi Jinping is insecurity. Um, this is someone who was plucked from as fortunate a life as you could possibly have in China at a young age during the Cultural Revolution. His father's denounced, he's sent off to do hard labor, which he later romanticizes, but it doesn't sound very pleasant. Um, there are different ways you can react to the experience of the Cultural Revolution. Personality matters. Um, if you're Jiang Zemin or Hu Jintao or, you know, some other person, your response to the Cultural Revolution might be, this was a terrible thing. Um, we cannot let this happen again. Do not let this happen again. We must maintain a certain low-key unity within the party and not let things get too out of hand, not do anything too crazy. That's one way of responding to the Cultural Revolution, a perfectly responsible way of doing so. Another way of responding to it, also perfectly understandable, is to say, oh my god, the Cultural Revolution was a terrible, terrible thing. That must never be allowed to happen again. And the only way to make sure it never happens again is to make sure that I'm in charge, that nobody can undo my authority, because otherwise, who knows what might happen? And that, I think, is what drives Xi. And that's what drives a certain assertive, insecure tone, both within the country and, to some extent, without. Internally, I think China, it's fair to say, has changed very dramatically. Um, the idea of a national security council that would combat both internal and external threats, the extent of the anti-corruption drive. Um, these are things that are really, you know, these were not things you would have seen in the Jiang and Hu years because the idea of rocking the boat would have been too tricky. To a certain extent, too, it drives what you're seeing in Xinjiang. Um, this notion of Xinjiang is a threat and it has to be neutralized before it becomes a cancer that swallows us all. If you're Jiang Zemin, incidentally, and Jiang, this is one of the few places where he's actually eloquent, Jiang says, look, religion has predated the party. Um, we're not going to undo it. It's there. You have to live with it. You can try to keep an eye on it. You can try to make sure that the imams are licensed, that they do the right thing and preach the gospel of the party and the mosque can coexist, but you can't undo it. Um, and a certain amount of trouble on the border is the price you pay for being an empire or he won't say for being an empire, but it's the price you pay for holding on to Xinjiang. It is an empire, but you know, empires don't know their names. Anyway, um, with Xi Jinping, of course, that level of threat tolerance becomes 
becomes something you can't contemplate. And that means a much more assertive policy in Xinjiang. Hong Kong's a little different, and we can talk about why if you want to. Diplomatically, what has not changed is that idea of the balance of power. Um, so still seeking decent relations, not just with this United States, but with Japan, with Russia, um, elsewhere. This idea that the smaller powers matter is still evident in outreach to Africa. What's interesting here, too, is that that idea of keeping on talking even through dark times seems to have worked. So in Japan, you go from what was probably an almost crisis in the East China Sea to the frostiest handshake in history, or one of the contenders certainly, to Xi Jinping and Abe being closer than <coughs> Abe and Trump, which is actually quite a remarkable thing if you stop to think about it. Um, during the height of the trade war rhetoric, the last, I've lost track of how many times there were. But one of the interesting things during the trade war rhetoric a while back was that while the news here was focused on the Sino-American trade war, if you looked at Xinhua's pages, they were all about Xi's visits to Africa and what the BRICs were doing. That idea of the smaller powers mattering and maybe being able to build a coalition of economic powers that would be able to supply what a fallout with the United States might not. Um, militarily, you continue to see cuts with this idea of modernization, but also this idea that it shouldn't be allowed to cannibalize your economy completely. So in some ways, the continuities are as stark to my mind as the changes. So that's a review of what they've done. Um, if you ask how successful were they, um, I think the answer would have to be you'd give them a reasonable grade. If you think of where China was in 1920, or if you think of where it was in 1949 when the PRC is founded, if you even think of the possibilities that would have been open to them post-cultural revolution or in 1989 around the time of Tiananmen Square, the fact that it is where it is today is really quite remarkable. The problem is that success comes with the seeds of its own failure. Um, when you have grown that powerful, do you wind up triggering your neighbors, say Japan, Vietnam, into cooperating against you, causing an arms race eventually that eats your budget up? When, and this is a problem that's not China specific, but world specific, I think, and this is why they were so interested in the Paris stocks. When your whole idea of what it takes to be a modern power, a modern country is predicated on the idea of economic growth, do you let that growth run rampant to the point where it drains the natural resources on which humanity survives? Um, Chinese civilization springs up around rivers. What happens when those rivers run dry? So those are the perils of success. Um, and I think I will stop here and open it up to questions. And maybe the perils of success theme is one we can take up during discussion. Fantastic. As per our tradition, uh, the first uh, few questions are reserved for our fellows. So uh, if we have any CSAC fellows with questions, I invite. Yeah, sure. Thank you for your talk. Um, <clears throat> and, and let uh, someone know who you are uh, and everybody else when you ask questions. I'll stand up again when I answer, just so, yeah. Hi, so I'm Julian Vitruliu. I'm a postdoc at CSAC. I've been studying nuclear engineering in China for three years. Um, my question is on the China RCT. Uh, something that you might have not emphasized a lot is that um, recently, since the last two decades, I think quite naturally with the economic power and the <coughs> military modernization of China, China feels more confident to be more assertive on the international scenes, especially um, in the surroundings in the region around China. Um, what we see today is that, for example, in the, the example of the South China Sea is that there's a lot of tension with its neighbors. Mm -hmm. China has a lot of tension with its neighbors. And uh, according, actually, to, at least to the Western media and to the, from the media of those of this neighbors, Chinese, China looks a little bit aggressive, or actually aggressive in this region. I wanted to know if there was another possibility for China to interact with its neighbors. Now that China is more powerful, was there a, a way for, be, for China to be more cooperative with its neighbors? Was there, was there also a question of different faction within the Communist Party? Is that something that's specific to the strategy of Xi Jinping? Mm. And his faction to be more assertive and aggressive in the region? Mm. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Question. Oh, it's a great question. Well, it's a great set of questions, actually, and observations. And I'll take a stab at some of them, but not all. Um, I'm going to leave out the bit of factions in the party, because I think to do that with any degree of serious accuracy, you have to be a head honcho within the party. And that's a job I haven't yet applied for. Um, <laughs> But I think the first thing I would say is that the premise that assertiveness and confidence go together is one that's incorrect. And it's a premise that's widely shared. But I think a lot of Chinese assertiveness in the South China Sea today is coming from the opposite place. It's coming from insecurity, um, specifically <laughs> from insecurity about what the United States might do vis-a-vis -vis China. So if you think about, you know, everybody talks about how much trade goes through the South China Sea, what a vital waterway it is. About two thirds of that trade, give or take, actually goes to China. Uh, you wanna talk about a country that has profited from freedom of navigation and unfettered traffic, traffic through the South China Sea. It's China, okay? Yeah. Freedom of navigation as most good American naval historians will tell you, is something guaranteed by the United States. Um, nobody else in the history of the world had ever allowed people to travel unfettered and made freedom of navigation such a big deal as we did post-World War II, leaving aside the little blip of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, but if you're sitting in China, right, you're seeing freedom of navigation, very important to us. And it's dependent entirely on the goodwill of the Americans who keep saying they have to keep us down. There is a genuine fear in China that the United States is out to dismantle the party and you know, keep China down. Um, you can understand where that fear comes from. If the noise out of Washington is the way it is, um, and if every now and then the Pentagon will issue statements on how it's going to, or there'll be stories on how the Pentagon is going to fight a war with a country that is left unnamed, but has two island chains around it and has all these weird land neighbors, you can begin to see why they would be a little concerned. So the notion that we have to do something about this is something that you can see China, taking, she's China especially taking to quite naturally. Other thing that's worth noting here, and I haven't seen a good take on this really, is the practice of dumping land into the ocean over there is not one that's unique to China. It would actually be wonderful if someone would trace the whole sequence and do a multipolar history of the South China Sea, not just from China's perspective, but from Vietnam's, Malaysia's, so on and so forth. That's one thing to bear in mind. So that's the China side of it. Is there another way? And the answer is yes. Um, my question in these situations comes back to <coughs> WWDD, what would Dung do? <laughs> Um, Dung's actually very specific on this um, at one point. He says, I don't want to have excessive activity in the waters near us because I don't want to scare our neighbors. The fundamental guarantee to me of Chinese security in this region is neighbors who don't feel threatened. The less threatened they feel, the more likely they are to rub along with us the way we want them to do. That level of restraint, that level of confidence in your capacity to defend yourself and supply what you need to, even leaving the South China Sea unstudded with different islands, comes from a place of supreme confidence. And it's a very difficult place for most of us to reach. You just have to talk, think about the way we talk about national security in this country to see why she is not all that weird about this. I'm not defending his conduct in the South China Sea, by the way. And I think the ecological damage of that is such that it's going to eat at China and the rest of the region for a really long while to come. But that's the answer to A, why they're assertive, B, what the other way would be and why it might not be feasible right now. It's Fandiar and then Colin Garvey and Dubak. Sure. Uh, Asfandiar, <laughs> postdoc here at, at CSAC. Short, simple question. What's your interpretation? Uh, how do you read BRI, mm -hmm. especially oh, through yeah. the lens of your interpretation of Chinese yeah. strategy? And if I can tap yeah. on uh, you know, an addendum, is there a particular U.S. grant strategy which stacks up well uh -huh. to your interpretation of Chinese grant strategy? You can throw some on the table, restraint, offshore balancing. You mean the ones we're not practicing right well, now? The ones that we're not practicing. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Supposed to come up with a new <laughs> You are? Okay. You personally. Um, 
this is how it's done typically. Uh, BRI very quickly, I should have got to this and didn't. Um, <coughs> So like I mentioned with who it was the old Silk Road and then it became the new Silk Road and then it became one belt, one road. Um, the interesting difficulty with, I'll say the positive and the negative too. So in one, in, at one level you can think of BRI as what we were talking about, realizing the importance of smaller countries. So if Pakistan matters, if Sri Lanka matters, if Kenya matters, and shoring up investment and trade there is something important. That, I think, was something that was being done well before the official proclamation and celebration of BRI, right? If you actually look at a lot of the deals, quite a few of them predate this bumper sticker that's being put on it. That's one thing to say. The second thing to say is, if you actually go to the BRI site, um, there is actually a website you can go look at for BRI, which is, you know, depending on your taste, interesting reading. Um, it seems to be everything under the sun. Uh, any trade deal or investment deal China seems to have struck almost anywhere, there's one small exception right here, is a BRI deal. Uh, Trump was actually offered BRI monies at one point to modernize the American railway infrastructure, which, you know, taking the tea in Boston strikes me as a very good idea, but that's just me. The problem with BRI is the backlash. Um, so one, in being everything, you kind of say, what is this? And then you say, well, it's just your policy of spending a lot of money in places in the hope that it'll A, pay back, B, win you some friendships. Um, you might have to square that with your climate change goals, which I think is a case of one hand not doing what the other is doing, but that's a separate conversation. Um, but the problem is a lot of these things don't pay back. You, know, you get to run a port in, say, um, Sri Lanka or Pakistan or Kenya. You're then stuck running a port in Sri Lanka or Kenya or Pakistan, which is a very awkward place in some ways to be. Um, you start having a major footprint in Pakistan and where once upon a time people would say, oh, it's fine. You now have people talking about Chinese imperialism. That's changed in like the decade and a half I've been studying this. Um, you'll get more complaints about people and you have more infrastructure that's vulnerable to terrorist attacks. So it comes with a sense of vulnerability abroad. It also comes increasingly with a backlash at home. Why are we spending all this money abroad when housing is a mess? Why are we spending all this money abroad when my kid's having a hard time finding a job? Um, so I think at some point, a sensible move would be to dial back, but that's just me. And I don't know if it's something that's feasible at this stage. Is there a US grand strategy? I would say no. Is there a Trump family grand strategy? I would probably say yes. What should US grand strategy be? I mean, that I think is one that's open to debate. And one of the things I'm hoping we see in the coming year is a real genuine debate on where do we want to go as a country? Because there are several reasonable options you can see. Um, there is a case to be made for, I'm not making this case, Fortress America, right? Why do we care about the rest of the world? How much should we care about the rest of the world? Beyond climate change, how much do we want to care about the rest of the world? And you can see a candidate articulating that quite sensibly and following them through on it, okay? Uh, standard response would be, oh, look at what isolationism did to us. It led to World War II. That's incorrect. We weren't isolationists before World War II. We were actually quite active on the world stage. And some of that was some stuff that contributed to World War II. There's a case for an American foreign policy based on hard cold realpolitik. Um, if you want to think about it vis-a-vis -vis China, the case has been made by Hugh White. Yeah, do a deal on Taiwan. Um, you can do a variant of that where you say, accept a deal where they control their half of the Pacific, we control ours. It's not going to hurt us, right? The Japanese offered us this deal in the run-up to World War II, and we turned it down. Um, so that's one option. Then you can say, no, it's going to be America as the global superpower. That's also a legitimate grand strategy. Or you can say it's going to be based on values and interests. So we have an interest in protecting the democratic values that have taken root on and flourished in Taiwan. And protecting that kind of thing should be our grand strategy. All of these come with different sets of costs that in a democracy, an electorate should be able to judge and vote on. And that hasn't happened here yet. Oh. Hi, I'm Colin Garvey. I'm mm -hmm. the uh, postdoc here at CSAC. I'm at the Human-Centered uh, Artificial Intelligence Institute. And um, 
Yeah, we're hearing a lot lately about a AI arms race mm -hmm. between the U.S. and China, and um, <clears throat> folks like um, Kai Fu Li has a book, uh, AI Superpowers, makes the claim that mm -hmm. China has a unique comparative advantage in 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 this. Uh, space in the fact that there's uh, far more uh, people to draw data from mm -hmm. and they are far more networked um, in their transactions in daily life uh, generating far more data and that this will be something uh, china can leverage um, but how do you see ai and this data advantage fitting into grand mm -hmm. strategy if at all yeah um so part of it already the first thing to say is I know absolutely nothing about AI, so you should take everything I say with that big caveat right there. Um, the second thing to say is I'm deeply suspicious of any new form of technology, but that's just me. Me too. Um, okay, good. Hey, Siri, what do you think about that? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm saying this in Silicon Valley. Anyway. Um, <laughs> The uh, so some of it's already being integrated. If you think, look at if you think of what's being done in Xinjiang, if you think of the kind of technology that's probably being deployed in Hong Kong, it's already being done. Advantages vis a vis America, um, I would be more dubious, um, and here's why I think the history of technology and what little I know about it, and the history of innovation and what little I know about it, say that. One of the, th well, two things. One thing you really need for an innovation culture is a place that's tolerant of failure. You have to be able to fall down, a la Steve Jobs, get your nose bloodied, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and say, okay, what's next? Um, till fairly recently, I would have said we did better on that score. Um, the best statement on this that I've seen was done in an op-ed by the president of MIT who said, you know, all this talk about shut China out, why is China saying made in 2025, why are we all, we shouldn't be freaking out about that. If China wants to make stuff in 2025, let them, we will compete and we will succeed because that's how things go on. The, <laughs> there's also, it's very, it's fair to say that a lot of the surveillance technology has come out of labs over here, right? Um, it's been developed over here with money we fund threw around. So I'll give you one example of this. Opposite my condo in Boston, there's a space called BrainCo. This is my new obsession. Um, and they have developed a helmet that they're deploying as, um, you know, tools to monitor how school children are paying attention. So you put the helmet on, it'll tell you how your brain waves are doing. And if the kid is paying attention, the helmet lights up a certain way. And if the kid's not paying attention, it doesn't light up that way. Um, all in the name of more effective education. Um, it's like, isn't this wonderful? The person who told me about it said, no, this is terrifying. This used to be the one space that was free of anybody's you know, interference. Um, it's American money. Uh, some of the clients are Chinese. And I think, you know, we've talked about a code for cyber warfare. Um, I think there has to be some code for what it means to be a human being that we'll have to talk about going forward with all this artificial intelligence stuff around. I cannot see, and this is true in most of the major challenges for a time, climate change, cyber war, avoiding nuclear Armageddon. I cannot see a successful and comprehensive code of conduct or treaty or whatever you want and that sort of thing without China and the United States and both being on the same side. Um, so, you know, in the 90s, the talk through the Taiwan Straits crisis, through the Hainan spy plane incident was we have a larger picture in mind. We need the United States for integration in the world trade system, so on and so forth. We both need one another now too, whether we like one another or not. And for all the warts and nastiness we all have. Right. Uh, for the record, when we modernized the Perry conference room, we rejected the helmets idea. For, here, here. Uh, <laughs> there, was, there was too much napping. Um, uh, I have uh, Deepak, uh, Melissa, and Maria, and then we'll open it up to, uh, and Jinru, and we'll open it up to everybody else. Go ahead, uh, Deepak. Thank you, Carl. Um, and thank you for this excellent presentation. I'm Deepak. I'm a pre doctoral fellow here at CSAC and a PhD candidate at Cornell's government department. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions which are going to give away where I'm actually originally from. Uh, so the first is with regard to 1962. Okay. And you said that... Uh, the so where are you from again? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the fallout from the, the, uh, you fall out with India, you build better relations with Nepal, Burma, and Pakistan. And the traditional explanation is in India. Where I'm from. <laughs> 
is that uh, 1962 was more of a punishment for India's aggressive North Look East policy as well as what they did with Tibet. Mm. Right. So I'm wondering if this was a larger plan, plan of balancing in the South Asian region versus like um, essentially ensuring that India toes the line mm. or at least falls back from being aggressive vis-a-vis -vis China. Mm. So bilateral versus yeah. multilateral balancing. The second question is to do with more recent events, which is, uh, and this relates to the U.S. Uh, Indo-Pacific strategy as well as um, the recent Quad that's coming up as well, right? Mm -hmm. There seems to be this alliance which is popping up to balance China, whereas China by itself also with regard to things like India has been fairly aggressive. You have the Doklam crisis recently, and you, on the other hand, you've also got things like BRICS and the Asia infrastructure the, uh, yeah. bank that's come up. So I'm wondering if there is a certain sense of lack of consistency now and whether there's been like a spanner thrown in the wrench with the new quad and rebalance essentially mm -hmm. in the region with, and, and so we are seeing different kinds of responses. One is, you know, you've got the BRICS and the Asian Development Bank and BRIC and the BRI. Uh, on the other hand, you do see very aggressive military military posturing as well. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering how you reconcile mm -hmm. Yeah. We were actually talking about that at coffee, but Colin and I were discussing that. Um, but I'll take 1962 first because it's a good runner into this, actually. So what happens in between China and India in the early Cold War is actually really interesting because the 50s, as you know, was an era of great friendship, right? Bandung. Both, yeah, Bandung. But even before Bandung, we both suffered. Uh, it comes about because of Tibet. It turns out that people in Tibet haven't stopped trading with the subcontinent despite everything that's been happening in the rest of the world. Because really, how would you survive if you did? Um, and they look at this and say, we should do a trade deal. And the premise of the trade deal should be the five principles of peaceful coexistence. Um, and that's how this comes around in the first place. And throughout it, there's this idea of, you know, the West colonized us. And having colonized us, they showed us how not to do international relations. And we're now going to show the rest of the world how to do international relations. There is also, as early as 54, the awareness in both Beijing and New Delhi that, you know, the rest of Asia, the smaller countries, might look at two such behemoths, and this is especially sharp in China, and be afraid. Um, specifically, Pakistan is what's in India's mind. And Pakistan's membership of the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization is something that drives Beijing up a wall. Um, it's like, you know, why are you with those Americans? Can't you talk to the Americans? Why are you with the Americans? But throughout this, there's the notion that, you know, we still have to keep a channel of communication open to the Pakistanis, which is a very interesting thing to do. Um, you're friends with our enemies, but we can still keep talking to you and tell you we're your friends, and friends don't do this. Um, so the relationship with both Pakistan and with India is quite good at the time. The other thing that's happening, incidentally, is that the borders are unclear, because one of the things Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists did before they fled to Taiwan was to gather up every border treaty, every map they could get their hands on, and take it to Taiwan. So you get to Beijing as the government of China, and you've got no idea where your borders are. You really don't. Like, okay, so where, where does this country stop, really? Um, and you have to figure that out. Um, and when Joan and I tell them, you know, I know there's some maps that show that. We haven't figured this out yet. He's actually being accurate because, you know, this is pre- artificial intelligence. So you really have to wait and see what's going to happen. So they form a committee. Um, which is what any good institution does when confronted with this problem, to say, okay, so where are our borders going to be? And when you form that committee, you start discussing with people where your borders are going to be and where they're not. Um, you do that with Burma, you do that with Pakistan, you do that with Nepal. In all those settlements, what's interesting is the Pakistan one comes after 1962, of course. But what's interesting is that there's a lot of give and take on both sides. So what's important is not a few square miles of territory here or there, or this speak always belong to our forefathers. What matters, it seems, is can we preserve the overall good relationship between us? And if we can do that, then where the border is doesn't really matter. Okay? Um, for various reasons that we can go into further if you want to, um, the Tibetan crisis takes hold and the Tibetans flee to India. And the perception is quick to take hold that India is using that 
to push an aggressive border agenda and not yield an inch, okay? Which is what makes the run up to war all the more intense. Now, what's interesting about this is that if you're going to go to war with India, two things matter. One, you want to maintain a balance of power in that region. So strengthening your relations with Nepal, strengthening your relations with Pakistan, strengthening your relations with Burma, making sure that a few concessions here and there are met with genuine goodwill becomes all the more important. Not that they wouldn't have done it anyway, but you can see the advantages of that playing out over there. With Nepal, incidentally, it's like a classic case of, you know, how a small country can manipulate a larger one. There's this wonderful moment where Joe and Lai is having this conversation with the Nepalis about the border. And they say, so how much money are you really gonna give us? And um, Joe says, you know, I really don't wanna get into that conversation right now. Well, the Soviets gave us X, the Americans gave us Y, um, and the Indians have given us Z. So we think you should give us at least more than the Indians do, don't you? Um, <laughs> and you get a border. Um, so that's one side of it. The other side of it, incidentally, is once you have had the war with India, by the way, in the run-up to the war, there's intense negotiation about, can we draw a line between us, right? Um, which the Chinese think they've made in good faith. But after the war, you won withdraw. Um, and you also tell everyone you are still open to a settlement. You are still open to the idea of talking with India. Um, doesn't go anywhere, but that idea is there and that's consistent with what we were talking about, this notion of keep on talking even if there is a conflict between us. So that's 1962. On the inconsistencies in terms of military posturing and economics, that's completely in keeping with the way China practices grand strategy. It's not just India, if you look at Japan, um, great trading partner, our ships have to see one another off around the Senkakus. Japanese Coast Guard's been very effective by and large at this. But we can still trade, we can still talk. Um, and you know, that's part of the idea of even if we have these difficulties, the larger relationship is worth preserving. Uh, Moisa and then Maria and then Kimberly. Thank you so much. I feel mm -hmm. like I've learned a ton. Oh, China, China I'm glad is you not my, my focus, but this was such an interesting presentation. Um, so I was curious if you could speak a little bit more, I think <clears throat> kind of this balancing act that you described of modernizing the, the military, but then also making sure that it doesn't eat yeah. up um, the economy is a really interesting one, especially because at least from what I've observed, uh, the role of the Chinese military in disaster management mm -hmm. in the region and responding to natural mm -hmm. disasters abroad has increased mm -hmm. over, over the last yeah. a couple decades, especially. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you see Chi the Chinese, mil Chinese military's role in disaster management as mm -hmm. part of its overall grand yeah. strategy and whether or not, I mean, the way that I read into it is that China is using this as an opportunity to kind of expand and modernize its military in ways that are not necessarily threatening to other countries in the region. And I would just be interested to hear yeah. kind of your thoughts. Um, sure, preface this with, I'm not a military expert, but this is something I know a little bit about, but um, there's a lot going on here. So. Typically over here, we think of there being a sharp line between civilian and military affairs, right? And that's one of the reasons everybody was so outraged recently. Um, there is a line. Um, you don't cross that line. Um, it's not done. Um, and most of the texts and civil military relations that look at the United States will emphasize that point. Um, China, that's not the case. The line between the military, the party, and other functions of life has always been a bit of a blurry one. And if it's ever been there. So if you think about quite a few of the people we've talked about, they're people with military experience, um, right? Um, they are people who know in Mao's case and in Deng's what guerrilla warfare looks like. So it's a much more fuzzy area. Um, when Mao is talking very early on about cuts to the PLA after the founding of the PRC, he has this weird notion, and someone really needs to delve into this much deeper, of it becoming a production army instead, um, which is a bizarre turn of phrase, but there it is. Um, in other words, an army that's going to do you know, some disaster relief, but also like, run a company on the side, do the kinds of economic things that decent people do because it's part of spurring production. And that becomes the sort of holy or unholy deal, depending on what your point of view is, where the military will have certain pet projects that will be left alone 
in exchange for accepting a certain amount of supervision from the party. With the disaster relief aspect of it, some of it is exactly what you were suggesting. This is a chance to see how the military does in this terrain. Some of it was, well, the military has a stake in these operations and therefore should be part of it. The third part, and this is coming from having done some disaster relief work, not in China, but in Pakistan. Um, very often when you're in a complete disaster situation, uh, the one institution left capable of responding is the military. So when the earthquake hit Kashmir, um, you need people to build roads into places where roads are hard to build. You need people with choppers to lift supplies. You need people who can set up a hospital and a latrine system and all sorts of things on the spot and do it in a disciplined, organized fashion. And you very quickly realize that the military is actually really capable at this. That's true in China too. To an extent. The other thing I'll say here, and this is not on disaster relief, but it's on policing, is that the line between policing and the military is a little blurry too in certain situations, which is why some of the debate about Hong Kong is kind of sort of, it's not wrong, but it's off key in asking, so when are you going to bring in the military? It's like, who kidnapped those people? What kinds of intimidation or underwear? There's a whole continuum. Um, in terms of how you use armed force that's worth thinking about. Also worth remembering that the Red Guards, um, they style themselves after military units. Uh, Maria. Hi, uh, Maria Greenberg, uh, postdoc here. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how you conceptualize the idea of grand strategy. Yeah. Because sort of, um, I know it's, you have to necessarily simplify everything for a short talk, but so far it sounded like grand strategy is being equated to reducing insecurity by means of military, economic, and diplomatic means. In China's case, yeah. But so if you come from a systemic perspective, that's how all states behave in international systems. Oh, that's not how all states behave at all. Um, you know, we were just talking about what a U.S. grand strategy looks like. You can say, instead of securing the state, my objective is to take over the world. Um, you can say, instead of securing the state, my objective is to launch a cultural revolution, right? And rewire the way human beings are made. Um, you can say, and this happens, and this is where you get debates about strategic drift very often. Um, you can say that certain axioms of the way we are have become so embedded that they've replaced grand strategy. <clears throat> so our grand strategy is to be a part of Europe, no matter what Europe is. Hmm. And then every now and then someone comes up and starts debating that and says, no, 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 we have a grand strategy that's distinct from that. Um, typically grand strategy, when you hear it thrown around the United States by certain people is something like there's a grand strategy for X. What's our grand strategy for China? What's our grand strategy for the economy? What's our grand strategy for climate change? And conceptually, to my mind at least, I'm not a political scientist, but conceptually to my mind, that's incorrect because a grand strategy by definition has to encompass everything. You can't have a grand strategy for China. You can have a policy on China that informs your larger grand strategy as a country. Does that help at all? <coughs> to an extent, okay. Uh, Shin. Um, so uh, my name is Shin Ma, a postdoc here at CSAC. So I was quickly wondering if you could comment to what you said about grand strategy and the passion. So my comment about the grand strategy is I feel like what you summarized on your presentation is like China really emphasized this kind of grand strategy for rule when the, in the United States is more about a grand strategy for conflict or like towards outward. But um, that's just my observation. My question for you is about the career or the cost that you mentioned briefly, but didn't go to. Mm. Um, so basically, you emphasize the continuity. One way to look at continuity is the leader's emphasis to keep the brighter country safe in a world that they saw as hostile. Yeah. And that will arguably make them to emphasize a lot again and again about the stories of the century of innovation and the patriotic education. Mm -hmm. So this will then, arguably again, make China as a victim of their own rhetoric, especially in the case of the South China Sea, as well as the protest in the Hong Kong, where the leaders take cooperation, the public wants more assertive, aggressive behavior. Mm -hmm. So my mm -hmm. question for you is, do you see uh, such dilemma real risk really exist in China, given the, their capacity of surveillance and the campaign? And B, if it does, then is there any way for China to get out of such dilemma, especially when it comes to the so-called uh, the South China Sea? Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, South China Sea, that's an excellent point. Um, South China Sea is a little different from Hong Kong. The challenges are a little different. But no, it's a fantastic question. I do go a bit into this in the book, but so here's the thing. Um, and this actually gets to the question about century of humiliation too, because you could say one version of the grand strategy is to rejuvenate China, right? Instead of making it safe. Those two things can go together, but which one goes higher is a different question. But the century of humiliation and forming the leaders, um, I think it's perfectly true to say that the century of humiliation has been hammered into the education system in a way that has been deeply counterproductive. Okay. Um, the rhetoric surrounding it is deep. There's a tone and a way in which you teach history that matters. Um, it's kind of surprising, but it does. Um, it is also true to say, um, and this is where people who say China is just exploiting the memory of the century of humiliation get it wrong to my mind. It is also perfectly true to say that when you have been invaded and dismembered in that fashion, <coughs> bearing it in mind and proceeding accordingly is not the worst form of statecraft imaginable. Okay. It would be irresponsible to forget that. Right? If you were to say our coast will never be vulnerable again, or we can turn our back on economic reform, and expect to stay secure in this world, be kind of irresponsible on their part, to my mind at least. That's one thing. The dilemma it creates in the form of patriotic education is genuine. And that dilemma actually accelerates during the Jiang Hu years. Remember we talked about Jiang bringing ideology back. Um, and you actually see some interesting demonstrations of this, um, both during the Yugoslavia incident I mentioned and in one of those spats with the Japanese where it's like, okay, we want to encourage students to go out and show their serious and show their patriotism. So shouting outside American diplomatic facilities and burning the American flag is a good idea. Um, someone I talked to was telling me, you know, who was there at the time, it's like, they really had a very hard time burning the flag because they didn't realize they had to pour kerosene on it first. <laughs> so there's this really clump, there's a video of this, this really clumsy attempt to burn the flag and it just doesn't work. Um, then someone realizes, oh, kerosene would help. But anyway, but Jiang says, okay, yeah, tell them to go out and demonstrate. That's good. But we want to make sure these demonstrations don't get out of hand. So tell them this isn't a demonstration against the party. Tell them there are lines to where the demonstration can go. You've got this weird sense of, you know, nationalism is a tool, but it's a dangerous tool and one that used improperly can turn against you in very dangerous ways. What that means for, so South China Sea had talked about, you know, there is a way of solving this where it's got, where you actually get more consent from your neighbors and say, how are we going to make this work? And the absence of dumping sand into the ocean would help there. Handled it very well with the Philippines, incidentally, where it was like, you know, get this judgment against us, throw some money around before you know it, the Philippines says we don't care. That's one way of doing business. But Hong Kong's an interesting case of this. Um, first thing to say about Hong Kong is, you know, this was, kind of one of those problems you don't look for. Um, this was an initiative triggered by an incident where Hong Kong should have extradited someone to Taiwan in theory, but didn't have the legal means to do so. And before you know it, everybody's up in arms protesting about those evil people in China and what they're doing. Um, and it came against a backdrop. So I would say here, you know, if you want to twist a metaphor really far, um, since we were talking about fires, um, the spark in this case was not of China's creation but the tinder around certainly was. Um, so, you know, this is coming against a backdrop of Hong Kongers being more and more concerned about what they see, quite rightly to my mind, as mainland tweaks of the one country, two, one country, two systems policy that was promised. It's also coming against the backdrop of some of Hong Kong's own problems, right? If you want to talk about income inequality, um, Hong Kong's the place to do it. If you want to talk about income inequality being exacerbated by a rush of people from across that border and that putting pressure on social services and the populist nationalistic rhetoric that can come as a result, Hong Kong is a fantastic place to do that. Um, Hong Kong is a victim to my mind, but it has also been in many ways a place that has exemplified, you know, some of the seamier sides of humanity that come out under stress. So that's the backdrop to what's happening now. And I think it's an important backdrop at which to understand why Beijing is doing what it's doing. From Beijing's perspective right now, if you look at Hong Kong, you're seeing 
people on the streets. And what, do you, what happens when you see people on the streets? Your mind goes back to in Xi Jinping's case, a couple of things. First of all, there's a cultural revolution, right? Um, people protesting on the streets and doing crazy things like setting people on fire is not a good way to go. That's one dimension to it. And you know, I'm not saying that's the right point of view on this. I'm saying just like the rest of us, the Chinese leadership are prisoners of their own experience. It's going to incline you to see things a certain way, whether you want to or not. You can be conscious of that, do those implicit bias trainings that people talk about, but it's there. Um, the second thing that's worth remembering is that there have been, and, you know, they've actually commissioned this in China, studies at the end of the Cold War. Um, what happens in Eastern Europe and what happens with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And Eastern Europe's actually the interesting case study here. It's like, you know, you give in a little way to the demands of the protesters. And before you know it, they're demanding a bit more. And before you know it, the whole thing's coming collapsing down, promoted by the West, which is going to talk about the triumph of democracy. And then you have the loonies in charge and everything goes to hell in a handbasket. You give way in Hong Kong, tomorrow there's a we're a Southern Chinese movement in Guangdong, which is actually still there. Um, you know, there's people who feel unrepresented and dissatisfied with their current lot in large parts of the rest of China, which is why you have to have a party minder in most classrooms and universities there to make sure that the professors don't say anything that could rock the boat, never mind Xinjiang and Tibet. So you give a little bit of way on Hong Kong, and before you know it, this whole brittle entity we've been talking about could come crumbling down. Um, I'm not saying don't be reasonable on Hong Kong. I'm saying you, this is the background with which they're approaching it. How do you solve Hong Kong is actually a really interesting question. Uh, to my mind, if you're a Hong Konger, and I've talked to a few of them about this, it's like you cannot reasonably after everything that's happened, set much faith in Beijing abiding by one country, two systems. You know, you can flip the switch today and flip it off again tomorrow. You cannot, um, therefore, expect any agreement that's reached on the question to persist beyond a certain amount of time. Demands for universal suffrage, you can see these quite naturally leading eventually to demands for what's already happening, a free Hong Kong, which is incidentally a perfectly reasonable thing to ask for, not one that Beijing is willing to grant, but you can see why that's a demand that you can say, okay, I can see how people would come up with this. From Beijing's perspective, therefore, giving in to any of these demands means the specter of a free Hong Kong with all that balkanization that I just mentioned. And the last time we saw balkanization, we saw great chaos under the heavens, to use the phrase. So a sustainable agreement over there is possible. Um, that leaves you with, broadly speaking, two options. Um, one's Tiananmen take two, right? Or some variant thereof, which employs that fuzzy line between police and military that we were talking about. Instead of actually rolling tanks through the street, you take the protesters in one by one using some of that surveillance technology that's now available and do what you can with that to contain the problem. Um, that means turning Hong Kong more or less into something that looks like Xinjiang. It means running it like a garrison state. Um, it means spending an enormous amount of money and technological and human power on a situation that isn't really helpful because what made Hong Kong valuable, of course, in the first place was that this was this thriving metropolis on which everybody was growing rich. Now you've got people parking their assets in Singapore instead. But that's one way of solving the problem. The other way of solving the problem, and this is a non-starter, but I think it's worth talking about nonetheless, is seeing you know, there's that wonderful Kipling line in the Jungle Book. You have freedom, eat it, O wolves. Saying, okay, we grant you independence. Do what you will with it. The Qing Empire, of course, once upon a time, empires were acceptable things, and you could do this, um, would have been perfectly comfortable, if not happy, doing this. You know, when you go out and conquer territory, you can also say, okay, we'll give it away. What happens, predict, presumably, <coughs> if you were to do that, would be something like this. Um, Remember that around the time of the handover, Hong Kongers were actually, to a certain extent, enthusiastic about what was to come. Um, the British brought democracy late to Hong Kong. Um, there was some resentment at the way the British treated them too. But if you grant Hong Kong independence, a certain cultural <laughs> affinity, a cert coupled with a certain absence of fear about the mainland's intentions, 
means that Hong Kong begins to work for you again in the way it was meant to in the first place, as a place that's <coughs> a little different, is therefore offering a certain multicultural, global economic boondoggle that people can get rich off. That also means, incidentally, if you extend the same deal to Taiwan, that Taiwan goes back to what it's always done, which is play great powers off against one another, and begins to feel a lot more sympathetic to you than it otherwise will. So instead of spending money and technology <clears throat> and human resources trying to run places that are unmanageable and killing them in the process, you are granting them freedom to work for you. An empire can do this. A nation state has a harder time of it. So I'm going to take the chair's prerogative to ask one final question. I just let me make one theoretical point, though, because I think Maria's point went a little under-examined on, I think the point that I heard you saying about grand strategy is, yes, all states at a minimum seek things like security, prosperity, and internal stability. Mm -hmm. But the requirements for that are not mm -hmm. objective material things. Mm -hmm. That is what constitutes threats to that security, what the opportunities mm -hmm. are, and most importantly, how best to do it mm -hmm. are all contested things. Yep. Uh, and that's much better than strategy I could have put is, it. is a it's a, a theory mm -hmm. of how to produce national security, mm -hmm. which is neither objective nor material in the way that re realists would think about. It. Anyway, that's what I I'm yeah. going to hear you saying what I think. So that's what okay. I think. Uh, but my question, uh, but uh, the question I have is, you know, if you look historically at, at world history, at least over the last you know 100, 150 years, some of the most dangerous states in the world have been highly revisionist but insecure countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, given your story about Xi Jinping, right, that, he, that his assertiveness stems as much from his concerns, his fears, his insecurities, as it does from a sense of China having arrived. Yeah. How worried should the United States and the world be as China's economy slows, it hits demographic, environmental headwinds, rest of regional issues bubble up, that the big concern is not that China's going to keep going like this, it's that China's going to slow relative to the expectations of hundreds mm -hmm. of millions of middle class people in China, and that Xi Jinping, as a result, will become more repressive, more nationalistic, and more assertive mm -hmm. uh, to deal with that. Is yeah. that it's how worried should we be about that? Given the, the oh, very worried, told? very worried. Um, <laughs> that's not a comforting answer. Um, so, okay, so the comforting version of this is that some of this has already been happening. Right, the economy has slowed to an extent. Um, there have been pressures that insecurity has deepened. The good news thus far is that countries you would not expect to, um, I'm thinking specifically of Japan or even India actually, have found a way despite that to live with China. And there seems to be under all the insecurity, a certain element of living with what constrains one at the end of the day to borrow from Hillary Mantel. Um, How long that lasts, of course, is, as historians like to say, highly contingent. But you know, if you want comfort, that's where I would seek it. Um, I'd also say that you know, the track record on dealing with China, both Nixon and Kissinger, is actually not bad. Um, there are certain things to draw on and certain things that can be done. So in those crises I mentioned, when really things could have gone completely awfully, Basic lessons to take away from them sound very simple, but it comes down to there's no harm in saying sorry, even if you have to say it in a weird way. So this is the famous letter of apologies that was non-apology apologies that was issued in the wake of the Hainan spy plane incident. Um, it's important to remember the larger stakes of the relationship. So when we were talking about AI, climate change, you know, substitute <coughs> that for global, uh, for global trade and so forth, and that can contain it. But it's not something that's purely structural. There's decisions to be made. And maybe some of the stuff should be like, you know, little post-its on decision makers' walls in both Beijing and Washington saying, here's how things could have gone. Here's why they didn't go that way. Um, there's a wonderful book by Christopher Clark, The Sleepwalkers. And he talks about the difference between why questions and how questions in history. And says, you know, people here, this is in the run up to World War I, contained the seeds of less terrible futures within them. And I think we contain the seeds of both. So complete disaster along the lines you're talking about, but also you know, ways of, despite genuine problems in China, finding a way to survive. And that in itself is not a small accomplishment if you think of the last 150 years. The other thing I would say while we're on this note of doom and gloom though, which I turned optimistic somehow, but anyway, um, 
if Xi Jinping is really insecure, you could be talking about, given all the pressures we've talked about, I'll come back to the grand strategy thing in a sec too. We could be talking about a situation where he's put out of power and someone more nationalistic comes to power. power. Perfect possibility, just requires the right combination of people. Um, you could be talking about, you know, classic historians line, change happens incredibly slow and then it happens incredibly fast. Yeah. All these pressures we've been talking about, slowing economy, environmental pressure, leading to the collapse of the CCP and China becoming some sort of Balkans. How that would happen, there's various scenarios you could sketch, but it's certainly possible. And I would say that's something we should be deeply worried about because that has traditionally been accompanied by a lot of violence and become a vortex for great power rivalry. So that's another scenario I would worry about. On the grand strategy situation, yeah, you're absolutely right. That was said much better than I could have said it actually. The only caveat I would add there is that instead of theory in this particular case, this is one of the really interesting things about it, is that it seems to be a set of instincts. Um, so, you know, the book I was thinking of when I did this one was John Gaddis's Strategies of Containment. And John, of course, had <coughs> national security strategy documents, which he then said, how does this measure up against what's actually done? I didn't have that here because there's no evidence that they actually sat down and produced something like that. What they do produce is an excellent track record of what they've done. And every now and then an articulation of why they're doing it. Um, some of the management literature on this, which I, uh, my dad's a management professor and I would hear about this all the time and hate it. But some of the management literature on this is actually incisive. Mintzberg and management actually talks about, you know, is there an instinct within companies or is it just something that arises? And I think in China's case, at least that's true. It's probably not the way we would teach grand strategy at a university, but it's just a counter example worth bearing in mind. And if you think about these people, they're not coming from the Ivy League. Mao's a peasant who finds himself in a situation and then there he is, Deng is stuck in exile and then he's back in power. So you learn by doing too. Well, uh, we're up against our time. Salman, I want to thank you for two things. One is uh, for suggesting what could be a new slogan for CSEC, which is planting the seeds of slightly less terrible futures. Uh, we'll, I think we'll it's a good slogan. We'll focus through that a okay. bit uh, to see if that works. Uh, but most importantly, thank you for a highly enlightening uh, historical, uh, s kind of sweeping uh, 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 historical view of China. I know, I know that uh, you know, it, it sparked a great conversation. So thanks again Pleasure. for joining us. Thanks for having me.